Hello students! Today we're going to talk about complex numbers and these arise in math because of an interesting quirk and this goes back to taking square roots. So let's recall some square roots. What is the square root of 9? Well, we know it's 3. What is the square root of 16? Well, it's 4, right? 4 times 4 is 16. 3 times 3 is 9. What about the square root of 1? What can we square to get 1? Well, the answer is 1. However, what about the square root of negative 1? This is a bit of a conundrum. In general, students are taught when they first learn square roots that we cannot take the square root of a negative number, that it is undefined. And the reason is because there's nothing that we can square and end up with a negative as an answer. If we take a positive number and square it, it's positive. If we take a negative number and square it, a negative times a negative is also positive. And so we have a bit of a problem. However, there are various reasons why it was important for mathematicians to be able to take the square root of a negative number. And so what they did was they invented a number that would allow them to do this. So mathematicians say that the imaginary number i is defined so that i is the square root of negative 1. They invented a number that allowed them to take the square root of a negative. This is called an imaginary number. And this is why when we're dealing with regular numbers, I'm, I'm using air quotes that you can't see, we call those real numbers. You can remember when we were solving equations, there were certain situations where we said all real numbers were solutions. Well, all the numbers on the number line are what we call the real numbers. Those are the ones that we've been dealing with probably since you were a small child. But now we have an imaginary number, we call it i, and it's defined so that i is the square root of negative 1. And by creating this one new number that's not on the number line, mathematicians have created a whole world of things that can be done. And the first thing that we can do here is we can use this to take the square root of any negative number. Let's take a look at the square root of negative 9. Now, we know that we can write negative 9 as the product of 9 times negative 1. And once we've split this up, we know that negative 1 is equal to i, and the square root of 9 is equal to 3, so this gives us 3i. Any time we're taking the square root of a negative number, negative 1, negative 9, negative 16, negative 27, etc., we can take that number and write it as the product of negative 1 and a positive number, and then that square root of negative 1 comes out as an i. So if we had the square root of negative 16, we can rewrite this as root 16 root negative 1, Square root of 16 is 4. Square root of negative 1 is i. This works even if it's not a perfect square. If we've got the square root of negative 7, we can still split this up into 7 and negative 1. And 7 isn't a perfect square, so we're just going to keep the square root of 7 like that. But we can rewrite the square root of negative 1 as i. So basically, any time we have the square root of a negative number, we can rewrite it as the square root of that positive number times i. This is the rule.
it might seem like mathematicians made up these imaginary numbers for no real reason, and they're not useful. However, square roots of negative numbers appear in many applications. One of them is in electrical engineering, uh, though they often use the letter J instead of I. Uh, it also comes up in 3D programming, like video game design, it comes up in fluid analysis, spring systems, and all other sorts of things. So even though it might seem like it's made up just to make your life more difficult, it does have important uses, which is why there are entire fields of math that are dedicated to these. Now, once we're familiar with the imaginary number i, which is the square root of negative 1, we're able to look at complex numbers. A complex number is a number that can be written in the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. Some examples of complex numbers include 8 plus 2i, negative 4 plus 5i, 37 minus 6i, and they don't all have to be integers. We could have pi minus 1 half i, for example or the square root of 3 plus 586.291i. All of these have a real part, 8, negative 4, 37, pi, root 3, a real number in the front, and then an imaginary part, 2i, 5i, negative 6i, negative 1 half i, 586.291i. And so these are complex numbers. In fact, even if we only have a real part or an imaginary part, it still qualifies as a complex number. If you look at 5, for example, that is a real number. It's on the real number line. But we can write it as 5 plus 0i, and it fits the definition of a complex number. So complex numbers include all of the real numbers. In addition, if we don't have a real part, if we just have something like 3i, how can we write this as a plus bi? We can write it as 0 plus 3i, and then that is also a complex number. Now, complex numbers are going to come up in a couple of situations for us. One of those situations is when we're solving quadratic equations, we are going to have some where we have complex numbers as our solutions. We haven't seen this yet, but we will in a little bit. And there are even entire fields of math dedicated to complex numbers. Um, I have taken, I think, three different courses in complex analysis that involve calculus on complex numbers. Um, but for right now, what we're going to do is just get comfortable with very basic arithmetic with complex numbers, adding, subtracting, and multiplying complex numbers. That's what we're gonna need for this course, and so that's gonna be our focus in the next video.